All right, guys, this is going to be the chapter 26 medications. So we start with our drugs, drug names, right? So we have the chemical name, which is the exact description of the drug's chemical composition and molecular structure. Then we have the generic name. These are names that is assigned by the United States Adopted Names Council. And um, this is what NCLEX is going to be testing the office is understanding the generic names of drugs. And then we have the official name um, is also the generic name that's listed in publications. And um, we have our trade name. Trade name is what the drug is sold as. Um, the brand name, so like Tylenol, um, these are, in my experience, usually easier to say. We have prescription drugs, which require a written prescription from a healthcare provider who's licensed by the state that they're prescribing in to either prescribe or dispense drugs. And then we have non-prescription drugs, which are over the counter. They may be purchased without a prescription and are seen to be safe for general population to consume. We have our mechanisms to promote our drug safety. So we have reliable sources of drug information, state and federal regulations, and standards controlling drug administration. And a variety of systems for storing and distributing medications and healthcare agencies all work together to protect the consumer, which is our patients and us. The following are used when researching a medication or drug. So we have um, formularies, nursing drug handbooks, physician desk reference, pharmacology texts, electronic and internet-based formularies, a clinical pharmacist, medication packets inserts, an institution, um, medication policies and procedures. So all of that is to keep us you know, safely using drugs. So the legal considerations um, in the United States, the Drug Administration is controlled by federal, latent, federal, state, and local laws, standards of nursing care, state nurse practice acts, and organizational policies and procedures define our role as nurses and responsibilities in administering medications. We have the uh, Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, which is of the US Department of Health and Human Services, regulates manufacture and sale of medications and monitors their safety and effectiveness, but also regulates through controlled clinical trials, the testing of medications that make it to market and that are available to be sold in the United States. And then we have various state and federal agencies regulate manufacture and sale of medications. Each state must conform to federal regulations concerning medications. However, they can have additional um, checks and balances that go beyond um, the federal regulations. So controlled substances are one of um, the their controlled substances are drugs considered to have either limited medical use or high potential for abuse and addiction. Other Controlled Substance Act of the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act of 1970 um, is that it's illegal to possess a controlled substance without a valid prescription. And the way that we um, classify them are by schedules. So schedule one is drugs that have high potential for abuse and have no acceptable medical use. So examples of that would be heroin, LSD, ecstasy, peyote. And schedule two identifies drugs that have an acceptable medical use, but still have a high potential for abuse. So opium, morphine, cocaine, oxycodone. Schedule three, identifies medically acceptable drugs that may cause dependency. So codeine and hydrocodone, hydrocodone is vacuum. And then our schedule four identifies medically acceptable drugs that may cause mild physical or psychological dependence. So examples of that would be um, diazepam, which is Valium, 
or alprazolam, which is Xanax. And then our schedule five identifies medications, acceptable drugs with limited potential to cause dependence. And ribotussin um, would be an, uh, an example of that. So we need to remember that controlled substances must be stored, handled, and disposed of, and administered according to regulations established by the US Drug Enforcement. Only prescribers with a national provider identification number have the authority to prescribe controlled substances. Controlled substances must be double locked. Um, so they're in a locked drawer with a secondary locked area. And so when you think about the medication picks, this is at the hospital, they're usually behind, you'll have to have a big drawer open up and then the little compartment is a secondary lock. Um, the facility must keep a record of every dose administered and a count of all controlled substances it needs to be performed at specific times. And it's typically during a change of shift so that way you have a day nurse and a night nurse counting to make sure. Um, and some organizations have actually taken that completely out of the nurse's scope and placed that onto pharmacy um, only. To facilitate counting and tracking and inventory, drug manufacturer packages, many narcotics um, are in section containers with each tablet labeled um, and consecutively numbered. There are different medication systems. So we have stock supply, which is bulk quantity. Stock supplies require you to measure the dose each time the patient needs it. So it's a potential for measurement errors is present. And many hospitals have completely pulled away from bulk supply, even though it's very cost effective. Um, the only thing that I've used in bulk supply in the past like five years was having children's Tylenol and triage because then I can just pull up and give them. Um, but again, you know, medications go missing or improper doses are administered. So most organizations have switched over to unit dosed and that's a locked um, individual single um, pack for one patient, the unit dose. And um, there's less chance for error with this. And we usually only get a 24 hour supply at a time. So the pharmacy will either fill the client's individual drawer with the medications or you'll have that individual pill to give. So our medication systems, um, we have an automatic dispenser and an automated dispensing system is a computerized system Similar to the unit dose, the lock card contains only medications frequently used on a particular nursing unit, and the computer database contains records and accounts of medications, as well as the medication prescription for each patient on the unit. The medications are usually packaged in unit doses, but sometimes bulk medications may be kept in the card. These method allows for immediate administration of newly prescribed medications, PRN medications, controlled substances, and emergency medications because the nurse does not need to wait for the pharmacy to fill prescriptions. Many of the hospitals that are here um, locally use the automated dispenser system. However, they have pulled away from um, the nurse being able to just give. Um, they've now been able to lock out meds where the nurse isn't able to override anymore to reduce that um, error. They kind of put it back on the pharmacist having to review the order. And then once they review it and approve it, that it will go live into the automated dispenser system. And then we also have self-administration. So self-administration is at times while in the hospital, patients may self-administer medications. Um, your book had the idea of nitroglycerin as being used for chest pain. Um, I've never seen that at a patient's bedside. Um, what I've seen patients self-administer would be their rescue inhalers. So if somebody has frequent asthmatic attacks, 
and needs to use the rescue inhaler, a lot of times we'll have that at their bedside. So that way, if they start to have an issue, they have access to that. Um, and it still needs to be secured. It can't just be laid out. So now we have our pharmacological considerations. And we have pharmacokinetics. Pharmacokinetics refers to absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of drugs. These four processes determine the intensity and duration of a drug's action. Each drug has a unique pharmacokinetic characteristic. And then we have our pharmodynamics, which are primary and secondary effects of the drug. So going further into our pharmacokinetics, we have our four processes of the absorption, the distribution, the metabolism, and the excretion. So the absorption, um, is the movement of the drug into the bloodstream. And factors that can affect this would be the route of administration. We know that certain routes um, enter our bloodstream quicker. So we talked about how when we're giving subcutaneous insulin, if we give it in the arms and abdomens, it gets quicker absorbed than if we give it in other subcutaneous routes. This um, would be the same type of thought process for all other drugs. So obviously, if we're doing it um, parental directly into the bloodstream, it's going to be a much faster rate than if it has to go through our oral digestive tract and be broken down in the stomach and then slowly absorbed. Then we have the drug solubility, um, solubility, and this refers to the ability of the medication to be transformed into a liquid form, and then it can be absorbed into the bloodstream. So we have protective um, barriers to make dr drugs less soluble, and that would be if we use an enteric coating on them. Um, drugs that are enteric coated, um, they cannot be decomposed by the gastric secretions, and the coating thus prevents the medication from being diluted until it reaches the intestines. Um, in this way, the coating delays the action of the medication. It can also decrease irritation effects that the medication can have on the stomach. And one common drug that we see with the enteric coating would be um, the um, potassium. Potassium very often is enteric coated. Um, so it's not digested in the stomach and it's digested more slowly in the intestines. And then we have time released. So medications that are formulated to dissolve slowly and release small amounts of absorption over several hours. We also need to think about the pH. So the acidity or the alkalinity of the local environment that will affect the absorption of the drug. So the acid content of the stomach aids in the transporting the medication across the mucous membranes. So an acidic medication such as aspirin are more readily absorbed in the stomach than basic, which would be alkaline medications such as sodium bicarbonate, which are readily absorbed in the more alkaline small intestine. The ionized molecules are lipid insoluble and thus cannot pass easily through the phospholipid layer of the cell membranes. And then we also have blood flow that can affect our absorption. So medications are absorbed rapidly in areas where blood flow to the tissue is greatest. So your oral mucous membranes um, have a lot of vessels there and that will be a quicker, whereas areas of poor vasculation, like in a scar tissue, would have a delayed absorption. So if you have somebody with a scar on their stomach, you wouldn't want to administer your subcutaneous insulin there because if you're expecting it to go quicker because you're putting it in a more um, rapid um, blood flow area, but because the scar is there, it's going to delay the absorption and affect the way that the body is. So then we move on to distribute um, the distribution. So factors that affect your distribution, which is how your drugs are transported to your tissues and your organs, can be affected again by your local blood flow. The rate of the distribution depends on the adequacy of the local blood flow in the target area, the site where the drug effect occurs. It's also influenced by the permeability of the capillaries to the drug's molecules, as well as the protein binding capacity of the drug. 
we have our membrane permeability, and these drug molecules must leave the blood and cross the capillary membranes to reach their sites of action. Some capillary membranes can act as a barrier. The capillary network in some organs consists of tightly packed endothelial cells that prevent some drugs from crossing. And then we have our protein binding capacity. A drug's tendency to bind to plasma proteins in the blood also affects distribution. For a given amount of drugs, some molecules bind to plasma proteins and the remainder will be free. For example, nearly all acetaminophen molecules are free in the bloodstream and they're therefore pharmacologically active. By contrast, about 99% of anticoagulant warfarin is bound in the blood. Its effects are produced by only the 1% of warfarin molecules that are free. We then move into metabolism. So metabolism is the biotransformation chemical concern version of the drug. So your factors that affect your metabolism would be your liver. If your liver is not functioning, metabolism um, will not occur as readily. And we know that the liver detoxifies also the kidneys, blood plasma, um, intestinal mucosa, and lungs will also help to detoxify stuff. But if the liver is impaired due to liver disease or age, the drug will be eliminated more slowly and that can cause toxic levels to accumulate. We also know that the health and the disease status of the patient can affect metabolism. Um, and that kind of goes back into the same thing with the liver. So if your kidneys or your blood plasm or your intestine or your mucosa or your lungs, or any of those other organs that help to eliminate are not functioning correctly, then the meds are just gonna to continue to accumulate. And then we have our first pass effect. So your first pass effect is oral medications that are absorbed from the GI tract are circulated through the liver before they reach the systemic circulation. Many oral medications can almost completely be inactivated in this way. This inactivation is known as the first pass effect. For this reason, oral medications are formulated with a higher concentration of the drug than they are for parenteral medications. Finally, we have our excretion. So excretion is the elimination of the drug from the body. Um, for excretion to occur, drug molecules must be removed from their sites of action and eliminated from the body. Drugs may be metabolized completely, partially, or not at all when they're excreted. Common organs for excretion are your lungs, your exocrine glands, your liver, your GI tract, and your kidneys. Drugs are um, excreted from... There's... Um, so how are drugs excreted from the body, right? The drug continues to act in the body until it is excreted. For excretion to occur, drug molecules must be removed from the sites of action and eliminated from the body. The kidneys are the primary site for excretion. Adequate fluid intake facilitates renal excretion. If your patient has decreased renal function, as indicated by an elevated creatinine level, you should monitor for medication toxicity obtain a prescription for adjustment of medication dosages if we're having signs of toxicity. If the drug is being broken down or the liver or GI tract, um, other, these are absorbed by bloodstream distribution to target site and return to the liver. Thus, this is called intrahepatic recirculation. The kidney later excretes these compounds, applying the increased peristalsis, so diarrhea, laxative, enemas, chronic bowel disease, all accelerates the drug excretion via feces. Inactivity, poor diet, and decreased peristalsis delay the excretion, causing increase in the drug's effects. Lungs. Most drugs removed by the lungs are not metabolized first. Gases and um, certain liquids administered by inhalation usually are removed through exhalation. 
strenuous activity and deep breathing increase pulmonary blood flow and thereby promote excretion, decrease cardiac output, such as the patient in shock or hyperventilating, prolong the period, hypo, so slow ventilation, prolong the period of time the drug for the drug to be eliminated. The exocrine glands, um, so that's your sweat and salivary glands, is limited. The elimination of these metabolites in sweat is frequently responsible for such effects as dermatitis. Drugs excreted in saliva are usually swallowed and absorbed as oral administrated agents. So your concepts related to pharmacokinetics. All right, we have time until onset and peak. The onset of action is the time needed for drug concentration to reach a high enough blood level for it effects to appear. This is a minimal effective concentration. When the blood concentration of the medication is highest in the blood, the medication has reached its peak action. Therapeutic range has a therapeutic level is the concentration of the drug in the bloodstream that produces the desired effect without toxicity. Therapeutic range of a drug is a range of therapeutic concentrations. At onset of action, serum drug is minimal. Peak level occurs when the drug is at its highest concentration, when the rate of the absorption is equal to the rate of elimination. After that, metabolic and excretory process begin to remove the drug from the tissue and blood. Trial level occurs when the drug is at its lowest concentration, right before the next dose is due. Biological half-life, a medication's biological half-life, is the amount of time it takes for half of the drug to be eliminated. Concentration of activity is the effectiveness of a medication that depends ultimately on its concentration at the intended site. And then we have the visual understanding or representation of onset, peak, and duration. So factors that can affect our pharmacokinetics. What factors affect pharmacokinetics? A drug's pharmacokinetics and therefore its effectiveness and safety are affected by the following factors. Age. Youth, youth smaller means less also organs cannot metabolize like adults. So when you're young, you have less needs. Um, Elderly can have declining liver and kidney function and have more chance of being toxic. Your body mass, the average adult dose is based on the drug quantity that will produce a particular effect in 50% of people ages 18 to 65 age weighing 150 pounds. Obviously, a person who is much larger or smaller than the average requires an adjusted dose. Sex, men and women absorb drugs differently because women have lower muscle mass and different hormone profile and different fat water distribution. Pregnancy, most drugs are contraindicated during pregnancy because of their possible adverse effects on the embryo or fetus. Drugs known to cause developmental defects are called teratogenic drugs. Examples of that would be alcohol or anticonvulsants like um, phosphine or phenotonin, which is dilated. Environment, so heat and cold affect peripheral circulation. A noisy environment may interfere with a person's response to an anti-anxiety sedative or pain medication. Route administration, the route of the administration influences the amount of a drug absorbed into the circulatory system and the distribution and distribution to the site of action. Timing of administration. The presence or absence of food in the GI tract affects an oral drug's pharmacokinetics. 
fluids, insufficient fluid intake affects the absorption of solid dosage forms. Pathological state, intense pain decreases the effect of opioids, disease causing circulatory, hepatic, or renal dysfunctions, or genetic factors, abnormal susceptibility to certain chemicals is genetically determined, and psychological factors. Some patients have the same response to a placebo, which is a pharmacologically inactive substance, as they do to an active drug. If a person has faith that the drug will help them, a placebo effect similar to the effect of an active drug may occur. Emotional states such as anxiety may cause resistance to tranquilizing drugs. So your drug therapy across the lifespan, right? We start with absorption and we'll talk about absorption in children, um, exaggerated in infants as a result of lack of gastric acidity in the shorter intestines. More complete topical absorption results from a larger body surface and thinner epidermis. Internal route is unpredictable. Decreased muscle tone makes absorption of parental drugs unpredictable. Gastric pH is higher, so medications absorb in acid environments or absorb much slowly. When we're calculating our children's dose, we know that we have to use milligrams a kilogram for dosaging. Your older adults' absorption, they have delayed, um, but are more complete. Gastric pH is less acidic because of decreased acid production in the stomach. Decreased gastric pH delays absorption of medications absorbed in acidic environments. Because of decreased intestinal motility, drugs remain in the system longer, allowing for more absorption. Distribution changes in children because protein binding can become um, a problem. There's greater chance of toxicity because of their low albumin. Water content in a child's body is higher than in adults. So your water-soluble drugs are less concentrated in the children, and fat-soluble drugs are more highly concentrated. For your adults distribution, the older adults are low albumin levels could create a problem with plasma protein bindings, increased risk for toxicity to multi-organ shutdown, altered because of less lean body mass, less body water, greater body fat, and dehydration, poor nutrition, and electrolyte imbalance can all change. Metabolism, children metabolize, may be altered because of immature livers. Um, and again, your best practice is to base dosage on body weight to avoid toxicity. Your older adults' metabolism um, can change because of presence of disease that could decrease the body's ability to metabolize it. Changes of age, higher blood concentration, and less excretion all cause greater chance of toxicity. Some drugs interfere with the liver's ability to metabolize another drug. So because we have polypharmacy or multiple medications, that can affect it. And then excretion, excretion in children is delayed as a result from their immature kidneys and repeated dosages can cause problems. And excretion for adults is decreased because glomerular filtration rates inhibits excretion from the kidneys and diminished renal function inhibits excretion, thereby increasing the risk of toxicity. So we're moving on now to our pharmacodynamics, which is the primary effects of our drugs. So the primary effects of the drug is what we consider our therapeutic effect of our drug. This is a predictable, intended, and desired effects. The primary effects, in short, are the reason the drug was prescribed. Our types of primary effects include palliative effect, which is to relieve the signs and symptoms of the disease, 
but have no effect on the disease itself. Supportive effects support the integrity of the body function until other medications or treatments can be effective. Substitutive effects, which place either body fluids or a chemical required by the body for improved function. Chemotherapeutic effects, which destroy disease producing microorganisms or body cells, such as antibiotics or antiplastic drugs. And restorative effects, which return the body to or maintain the body's optimal health levels. Our secondary effects are unintended or non-therapeutic effects. That is all effects other than the intended effect for which the drug was prescribed. All medication cause secondary effects. These can be side effects, adverse reactions, or allergic reactions, which can either be harmless or cause injury and which can sometimes be predicted. So our side effects are unintended, but often predictable. So things like if the, patient, if the medication we know could be dizziness or create constipation. The most common side effects are nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, dizziness, drowsiness, dry mouth, abdominal distension or distress or constipation. Adverse reactions are harmful, unintended, unusually unpredicted reactions to a drug administered at the normal dosage. The most severe then side effects and often require discontinuation of the drug. The FDA defines severe adverse reactions as those that are life-threatening, require intervention to prevent permanent impairment or death, or lead to congenital abnormality, disability, hospitalization, or death. Health professionals must document serious adverse reactions according to the agency policy and report them to the FDA. And that's not something that you're gonna to have to report. Um, essentially, when you create your incident reports, the hospital would, would push that information forward if need be. Um, toxic reactions are dangerous, damaging effects to an organ or tissue. Toxicity may be caused by any of the following reasons. So we could have overdosing, which is administering a dose that exceeds the prescribed amount, with examples including respiratory depression from excessive morphine and hypoglycemia from too much insulin, accumulation of the drug in the tissue, related to long-term use or inability to um, completely excrete the drug or metabolize the drug, or we have abnormal sensitivity or an allergic response to the drug, which moves us into allergic reactions. So medications most frequently implicated in an allergic reaction are antibiotics, biological agents, and diagnostic agents. So like your CAT scan dog. Um, idiosyncratic reactions are unexpected, abnormal, or peculiar responses to a medication. Idiosyncratic reactions may take the form of extreme sensitivity to a medication, lack of response, or a paradoxical, which would be an opposite response, such as agitation in response to a sedative. Um, Ativan very much gives an idiosyncratic reaction sometimes to our elderly population where we're giving it to sedate them and instead they get really agitated. And Ativan's generic is lorazepam. And then we have our cumulative effect, right? And this is an increased response to a repeated dose of a drug that occurs when the rate of administration is greater than the rate of the metabolism and excretion. So our drug interactions. We can have an agonistic interaction, which is when one drug interferes with the action of another drug. So vitamin K is an agonistic against Coumadin or Warfarin. Vitamin K will help the blood clot, 
while that warfarin is trying to thin it. Your synergistic is that an additive effect, that the effect of both drugs together is greater than the individual drug. So non-steroidal anti-inflammatory helps with pain and opioids help with pain. So if we pair the two of them together, we're going to get greater pain relief than if we just give one by itself. Just like that, alcohol and opioids have a synergistic effect for increased central nervous system suppression. So that's why we always warn patients You know, if we give you this narcotic, you can't drink with it because you might suppress your central nervous system too much and stop breathing. Then we have incompatibility. So incompatibilities occur when multiple drugs are mixed together, causing a chemical deterioration of one or both drugs. Um, We can see this when we sometimes mix medications um, in an IV and you'll see them crystallize or burn and we need to check all medications before we mix them to make sure that they're compatible because the crystallization we can see, but the burn we might not see. So just because you put two drugs together and they don't like visually react in the syringe, doesn't mean that when you instill them into your patient that it won't continue to um, burn them and you wouldn't see that. They would just be in pain. Um, And then we have our foods. So food can definitely affect the way that our drugs react. Um, If we have high fatty foods and those lower in fiber, they will delay stomach emptying and medications can absorb by up to two hours longer than what they should. Um, If we have acidic citrus foods and juices, they can enhance the absorption of things like iron Some citrus foods like grapefruit interact with medications and they can act as an agonistic manner, meaning that they're going to, you know, interfere and decrease the effect of the drug. Um, Your carbonated soft drinks can cause medications to dissolve faster um, or we can be neutralized by them or experience a change in absorption rate in their stomach. Dairy products taken with antibiotics, such as tetracycline, decrease the absorption of the drug in the stomach. And foods containing tryptamine, so things that are aged, dried, or fermented, um, can um, affect the way um, MIOIs are. Con- and so if you take an MIOI with the try me, you can actually cause your patient to go into hypertensive crisis. So we need to make sure that we teach our patients, you know, dietary considerations with drugs. So drug abuse and drug misuse, right? Tolerance, tolerance is decreasing response to repeated doses of a medication. The person requires more and more of the drug to achieve the desired effect. Usually we talk about tolerance in regards to our pain medications, but tolerance can be built up for other drugs as well. Then we have dependence. So dependence is a person's reliance on the drug or the need for the drug. Um, It leads to a compulsive pattern of drug use where the the user's lifestyle centers around procuring and taking the drug. Drug misuse is the non-specific or improper use of a drug. This includes alcohol, over-the-counter medications, and prescribed medications. Drug abuse is the inappropriate intake of a substance by the amount, type, or situation continuously or periodically. Illicit drugs, also known as street drugs, are drugs sold illegally. Many prescription drugs, like hydrocodone, are sought after for their mood altering effects. Prescription drugs can be abused when they're taken for the purposes other than medically attended. So you can have prescribed medications that enter the world of street drugs because they're being sold um, illegally. So measures and calculations, 
We're not going to talk about calculations because the school has their specific way that they like to teach you it. Um, however, we will talk about the measurement system, right? We have the metric system, and this is the preferred system to measure drug dosages um, because it promotes accuracy and allowing for calculations for small drug dosage. The disadvantage of the system is in the United States, many people outside of the healthcare system are not familiar with it. So we as healthcare providers need to be able to use the metric system and convert it to a household system so that it's easier to teach our patient about how to use their home medications. Um, and then we have our special unit measurements, which are units and milli equivalents. Um, insulin is commonly used as a unit measurement. Um, typically 100 international units is the standard strength preparation. And one ml of fluid medication typically contains 100 units of insulin. One ml of 100, um, one ml of heparin does not contain 100 units of heparin. So we just need to know that the unit measurements are not the same for all drugs. And milli equivalents, which is the MEQ, indicates the strength of the ion concentration in the drug. A milli equivalent is the number of grams of a solid contained in one ml of a solution. So an example of that would be um, KCL, um, potassium chloride, that's measured in milli equivalents. Our key point here is note that units and milli equivalents cannot be directly converted into the metric or the household system. That's our key takeaway here, right? Because of, as we just said, just because, you know, insulin has 100 units in one ml, heparin does not. And being that the milli equivalence is the strength of the ion, it's going to change with each particular drug. So just because we, we need to remember that that the units in the milli equivalents are not directly converted to your metrics or to your household systems, okay? And then the apothecary, um, it's not something I've ever used because that's the British apothecary system. Um, and it's Roman and um, numerals, Roman numerals and acrobatic numerals. And it's only been in the United States since colonial times and they use it for aspirin, um, but it's less convenient and it's less precise and it's not typically used. So, all right, moving on, we have our components of the medication order or prescription. So if we have an inpatient, we have prescriptions for medications, um, that are entered into the patient's electronic healthcare record. And it, hopefully it's going through that CPOE, which is the computer ordering for the providers. Um, and it should be automated and printed. And we need to make sure that if we're having to actually take an order because the physician is not entering it through their CPOE, then we need to make sure that we know that it's, we have the date and time, that we have the client's full name correctly, that we know the name of the medication, that we know the dosage size, the frequency, the number of doses, the route of administration. And then we always wanna do that telephone order read back and verified. And we wanna print the name of the prescriber and we want to put our name next to it. Now, if it's a regular prescription, and the, like a filled out form, then that prescription needs to have the provider's DEA number on it um, and their credentials. So an example would be the date, the time, the proper order, and then the comma, and then the doctor, whoever they are, and then you have that slash, then you put your name, an RN, and then telephone order read back and verified. And telephone order read back and verified can go before the doctor, after the doctor, or after the name. It just has to be in there to say that, you know, I received this over the telephone, I read it back, and they verified it, and it's good for her. So our types of medication prescriptions, again, we can have written prescriptions, 
um, and this is when the prescriber writes the prescription, we can have an automatic stop date, which is, this is a protocol that hospitals use for discontinuing medications. So if you have a seven day course of antibiotic, it's gonna stop on that seventh day. You're not gonna be able to give the medication anymore. You have stat prescriptions. This means it's a single dose medication. It's to be given immediately. Some organizations have very specific times to their stat medications where they say that it has to be given within 15 minutes. Some say 30 minutes, some say an hour. It depends on where you work and what your policy says. You can have single dose or one time prescriptions. And this is um, indicates that the medication is to only be given once at a specific time. A lot of times this is for before surgery or before a diagnostic procedure. So it can be um, an antibiotic that needs to be infused one hour prior to cut time, or it can be like an Ativan, a Lazarazepam, or a Diazepam, something to relax your patient before they go down for an MRI. A standing prescription, these are um, officially accepted as um, sets of prescriptions to be applied routinely by nurses for the care of patients under certain conditions or under certain circumstances. So um, I would frequently see this if I was admitting a patient to like a telemetry unit for chest pain and the doctor, we would have standing orders for all of our chest pain tally patients. And it would be, everybody would get like 81 milligrams of aspirin and everybody would get a nitro PRN order and you would just click that and then everything would go over for that patient. PRN prescriptions. So your PRN prescription requires the nurse to determine in collaboration with the patient when the medication is to be given. So the prescription is specific to the condition for which the medication is being given and the minimal time intervals between doses. The medication cannot be given any more frequent than prescribed, even if symptoms persist. So anti-nausea medications, um, Zofran, which is um, the star or just that, and I think it's, I don't know, I can't pronounce it right. Um, it's in friend. It is a PRN medication that we give for nausea. It's usually given every six hours via IV. But if you give that medication and two hours later, your patient is still having nausea, you cannot give it until you get that six hour mark. So we might need to call in to get a secondary PRN medication. And then we have our communication of prescriptions. So we have, again, the handwritten prescription that can either be handwritten or pre-printed. We have oral, and we know that typically oral prescriptions are now only when we're in emergency situation. And then we have by the telephone. So if we call a provider saying that, you know, we give them the situation and the background and the recommendation for an anti-nausea medication. And then they give us the order for the anti-nausea medication. Some hospitals, you're gonna to have to write that on a sheet. You're gonna scan that down to the pharmacy. The pharmacy is gonna enter it into the computer system. Once it's entered into the computer system, you can give the medication and your provider who gave you that order should within 24 hours co-sign that order saying, yes, you know, yes, I gave this telephone order. Yes, I agreed to it. And if not, then the medication can be deactivated in that 24 hour period. And if you put the wrong provider, they're going to say, no, I did not give you order for that. And then you're going to have to figure out, you know, because now you gave a medication that didn't have an order to it. So always make sure you have the right provider and always make sure that we read that order back and verify that what we heard them say is what they actually said. Moving on. All right, medical errors. So um, medical errors are common. And very often we don't even know that we made the error because nobody sets out their day wanting to make a medication error. Um, causes for medication errors could be lack of knowledge or information. So lack of knowledge of the drug, an incorrect dose, incorrect mixing, 
too rapid of infusion, drug interaction, those are the most common factors contributing to that medication error. Um, lack of information about the patient, so not knowing what their allergies are, other medications they're on, current lab results. Um, in lab, I had some of you looking for your DIG levels and your INR levels, and depending on the hospital system, if it doesn't prompt you to look at those levels. Sometimes we just get in this mechanical mode where, you know, Coumadin's due at seven o'clock and we give it and we didn't realize that our INR was higher than what it should be. So we really need to know what our medications are for and what's going on with our patient. Um, faculty communication. So in the video, we saw, you know, one nurse pulled up the drugs after another nurse had given it and they were able to communicate, you know, it was either um, she didn't chart in time, so that communication was lost. Um, other communication would be if the telephone prescription was taken incorrectly, if the prescription was written um, on the wrong patient's chart, if the dose was written wrong by misplacing a zero or a decimal point, um, abbreviations that are commonly misunderstood, or poor or no documentation. And then equipment errors. So wrong equipment is used to administer the drug or equipment malfunction, or if it's just used improperly. So um, if you have somebody who's on an IV pump and the IV pump shorts out and dumps the medication into them, that can be an equipment error. Um, calculation or measurement errors, which I believe you guys are all aware of how important calculations and measurements are, and also how easily we can mistake something when we do that. And then others um, would be medication is improperly handled or stored. Uh, certain medications need to be shielded from light, even when they're infusing in the patient. So if you do not have that proper bag shielding it, that would be an, an error. Um, patient identification, right? If we don't check properly. Um, if the lighting's inadequate and we don't really see what we're doing. Um, we could have a patient that we thought put all the pills in their mouth and instead one pill was in their bed. Um, very often I've changed bed and saw like these little pills and you kind of sit there and say, oh, wow. So there's like three levothyroxines in their bed right now. And it's kind of because the lighting's not adequate and the nurse really doesn't see that the patient's dropping that pill every day. Um, fatigue, right? When we nurses are fatigued or we're distracted or we're interrupted, that can all cause medication errors. Or if the medication is given and the patient's allergic to it, right? We wanna make sure that we um, document those allergies because of very often we can have, you know, misdocumentation in one area, such as allergy, and then we give it and lo and behold, now we have an error. And if we have somebody who's reacting to a medication, we always want to make sure that we stop the infusion of that medication immediately. And we want to make sure that we, after we stop it, then we contact the appropriate people. So using technology, right, to prevent our errors, rather than taking an order on the phone, if the prescriber uses the computerized prescriber order entry, the CPLE, that takes us nurses out of that potential for that error to happen, right, because now it's on the provider that they order the correct drug. However, if the doctor orders the wrong drug, we should still catch it when we're doing our patient rights. Um, barcode administration is another thing that's um, helped reduce it. So the barcode in combination with the CPOE provides a highly effective system for identifying the right patient. It transfers data electronically, eliminating error-prone paper transcription process. When used correctly, barcoding with the unit dose um, prevents the nurse from selecting the wrong medication because it's going to say, no, you're not scanning the right drug, this is wrong, or you're not scanning the right patient, this is wrong, 
and it should stop us from continuing. Smart pumps, right? This is our pumps that we use in the hospitals and they can help us avoid programming wrong doses into it. Um, it can help us with making sure that, you know, we put in the patient's weight and we put in the drug and it says, okay, this is supposed to be a milligram, a kilogram drug and it does all the math for us. Um, we still need to make sure that it's right. Um, as I said in class, um, our pumps that were programmed for heparin weren't programmed correctly. So nurses were using it thinking that, okay, you know, I have a high dose, this is a high dose, I'm programming it, and they didn't realize that the formula that was in the pump was wrong. So it was, you know, a big issue. And then we have our automated dispensing cabinets and they minimize our human error because they do not give us access to medications that aren't on our patient's medical administration order sheet. So what should you do if you commit a med error, right? First thing we want to do is we want to immediately assess our patient, okay? Um, assessment number one, we want to report our findings to the primary care provider. And then we need to follow whatever our institutional guidelines are for if, you know, you're going to contact the nurse manager. If it's in the middle of the night, you might not be contacting your unit manager at night. You might contact the nursing supervisor who's on. So, um, but, you know, number one is you're going to assess your patient you're going to want to make sure you do vital signs on them and you're going to want to contact um, their primary care provider. So assessment of medications, when do we assess? Like constantly, right? We want to assess before we would give our medications. We want to know what the patient's vital signs are. We want to assess whether the patient's general condition is appropriate for the medication. We want to evaluate our knowledge of the medication and any biological factors that affect the drug's metabolism. And depending on what drug you're giving might be how, how soon that assessment needs to occur. Right. So if we're giving a medication that really doesn't affect the vital signs and we took our vital signs at seven o'clock in the morning and it's 11 o'clock in the afternoon, we might not have to repeat those vital signs. But if we're giving something that is going to affect the vital signs, then we might want to get a set that's only like an hour old, 30 minutes old, 15 minutes old. And the more you learn about different medications, the more you'll realize before you administer how tightly you have to do these specific assessments, right? And then while we're administering the medication, you need to make sure that the patient's mental status is appropriate, that they're able to swallow if we're giving oral medications and their coordination, right? I say how often that we find little pills in bed, if the patient's coordination to get the pill cup up to their mouth and get the pills in isn't good, then we might have to change that way that we're going to be administering that medication. And then after it, right, what's the effectiveness of the medication? Did it work? Were there side effects? Was there adverse reactions? Am I starting to have signs of toxicity? All of that is really important. We also want to know what our patient's medical history is. So again, prior to administering the medication, you want to check what their allergies is, if they've ever, ever had reactions to medications. Um, as you start to learn more and more about meds and pharmacology, you'll learn that many of antibiotics are in the same family. So if I'm allergic to one in that family, most likely all of those antibiotics in that family are going to cause me problems. So it's really important to know what their allergy is, what their reactions are, what over-the-counter medications they have, because we know a lot of over-the-counter medications could also affect the way that our body handles the meds that we're giving now. And we want to do a physical examination to help us identify any potential problems and maybe for adapting our medication administration procedures. So after we do our assessment, what do we move on to? We move on to our different type of nursing diagnoses, right? So different nursing diagnoses or different nursing concepts 
as we're going through our nursing process would be our risk for injury or an ineffective health management, right? So risk for injury could be polypharmacy, where we're having an overuse, underuse, or misuse of our drug. We can have our polypharmacy, which is the ingestion of numerous medications. Many people self-prescribe or rely on over-the-counter medications for symptom relief, for like insomnia, headaches, joint pains, and digestions. They may continue taking medications in combinations with prescribed medications. Polypharmacy increases the potential for adverse reactions and for dangerous drugs and food interactions. And I use the example in class about my, um, my husband's um, grandmother who just kept going to the doctors complaining about her her swollenness and everybody kept giving her different diuretics and then she went and complained to somebody else about peeing all the time and they gave her the no-go drug so her polypharmacy landed her in the hospital um, with a lot of complications so we just have to be really aware of everything they're taking um, and then we have our misuse overuse and underuse right some patients um, do not take their medications consistently or they take them um, too much. So we need to be aware of that. And then we can also have an ineffective health management, which is the failure to consistently integrate a therapeutic regimen for illness into daily living. As we assess the patient's reasons for ineffective health management, we be, need to be prepared to address numerous reasons such as lack of symptoms, intolerable side effects, forgetfulness, inability to afford medications, disagreement with treatment plans, or lack of knowledge. Some patients, particularly older patients, have visual and motor deficits that limit their ability to read labels and manipulate their access to their meds. So bottle cap issues and syringe issues. All of that falls under um, ineffective health management. So when we get into our planning phase, right, our planning outcomes, they need to be very specific. So something might be like in one week after teaching, the patient can describe adverse reaction to the medication, right? That would be specific. Um, and there are so many different diagnoses that could fall into this. So it could be like a comfort, a motivation, that self-care, um, and our interventions would be completely dependent on what that diagnosis ends up being. But we need to make sure that when we're planning our outcomes that they're specific. If you're gonna go into teaching, for teaching medication self-administration, right? We need to know and understand what we're talking about in order to take the drug safely and effectively. So we need to tell our patients that when they're prescribed a new medication, they need to know why they're taking it, how long they should take it, and what the side effects can be. We tell them to keep a list of medications, including the dosages and times. And they need to take this list with them when they visit their healthcare providers or if they're going to the emergency room. Um, they need to take the medication as prescribed. So um, older adults sometimes can forget to take their medications. A simplified plan can help them follow it. So we might need to advocate with their providers to simplify their plan so that they're taking it with meals or at bedtime so that it's easier for them to remember. They need to communicate with their prescriber and notify them if they're having side effects or adverse or they have questions rather than just discontinuing the medication. Because if I'm on a medication to treat, let's say, hypertension, and they put me on a beta blocker, and I say, I can't tolerate this, it's making me too tired, and I just stop taking it, well, then my hypertension is not being treated. So educating our patients to communicate is very important. We need to think about safety. So um, wearing medical alert bracelets, um, telling them to um, keep things in childproof caps, um, knowing 
where to find the expiration date on medications is important, storing them safely, administering them correctly. So practices that you as a nurse can do to ensure safety. So um, our priority as nurses is we wanna make sure that we um, do no harm to our patients. We don't want to harm them. But we need to make sure that the medications are given safely. So um, source of error includes giving the dose at the wrong time, admitting doses, giving the wrong doses, and giving the dose without authorization. Many er errors occur as a result of an interruption or a distraction. So if we create safe zones, um, that's one recommendation, and that's when preparing or administering the drug, um, we can make a do not disturb sign and use it in the medication room or um, wearing a bright yellow apron when we're passing out medications or just having a sign on our computer saying, you know, this is a do not disturb zone or this is a safe zone, you know, medication preparation and process or something just to let people know that you're concentrating so that we don't have an error. Um, and then we also have the three checks and the rights of medications, um, which we'll go over in the next few slides. So our three checks, right? We're supposed to have the check upon initial removal. So um, on our MAR or, or medication um, administration record. Um, so if you're the order and then during our preparation, so as we're, you know, pulling out those meds, we're supposed to check it against that order. And then at the bedside, so we've already checked it against the, the order and we've already prepared it and checked it. And now we're with the actual patient and we're going to check it again. And a lot of times the, the irony is, is that a lot of errors are caught at this point because now you're looking at your patient and you've pulled your, your medication for your heart rate and your blood pressure. Now you're looking at your patient saying, well, what was their heart rate and their blood pressure? And hopefully that's when you catch that perhaps their heart rate or their blood pressure is not what it should be. Or, you know, this medication has a therapeutic drug level with it. Now you're looking at the person saying, oh, what was your actual level? And hopefully you catch it before it actually goes in their mouth. And then we have our six rights. So our six rights means that, you know, this is the right medication and I'm giving it to you the right dose and it's the right time of the day, right? It's not too soon, it's not too late, that you are the right patient. So I have your first and your last name and then I have my right documentation, okay? And then we have other rights. So our other rights is, you know, your patient has the right reason. Why am I getting this medication, right? Is this medication a tranquilizer to help me sleep because I can't sleep? And the right to know. So this means that the patient knows the name of the medication, why it's being given, what its actions are, and any potential side effects. And the right to know is something that the um, Joint Commission checks through the H caps, right? Patients take these little surveys and they say, nope, that nurse never told me any potential side effects. She just kept giving me meds and she didn't even tell me why she gave me the meds, right? So we need to make it our professional practice that every time we give a drug, we're gonna be able to tell the patient why it's being given, what it's gonna do and the potential side effects. And then we also have the right to refuse, right? The patient is allowed to say, nope, I don't want this medication. Um, and it can be regardless of the reason. Now, if the patient's not competent, then they do not have the right to refuse. Or if um, the patient's at harm to hurt themselves or somebody else, and we're giving them for that reason, then they don't have the right to refuse. If we're not familiar with the drug, we need to look that up, right? So we would use the physician's best reference or some other electronic catalog system so that we know the reasons why we're giving the medication. 
So moving on, we have the different routes of administration, right? And the most commonly used route is the oral route. And we can have many different types of medications in that oral route. So we have our liquid medications. These are commonly used for children or for older adults. It can come in multiple dose bottles. So you need to pour the individual dose into a disposable calibrated cup. When we're pouring, we need to hold the bottle so that the liquid does not run onto the label, making it difficult for the next person to read. And we also need to hold the cup at eye level when we're measuring it. Our buccal and sublingual medications, although placed in the mouth, are intended for absorption in the mucous membrane rather than the GI tract. Some soluble forms of medications and enzymes preparations are administered by this route and are rapidly absorbed, some within seconds. Buccal medications need to be put in the cheek and sublingual medications need to be put under the tongue. Common sublingual medications would be Zofran or nitroglycerin. Internal medications are for patients who cannot swallow or have feeding tubes. Your internal medications you give orally um, through your nasogastric, your gastronomy, or your J tubes. We have special situations or considerations when we're giving oral medications. So if we have medications that um, are difficult, they have bad taste or they could cause damage to the tooth enamel or just discolor the tooth, we might wanna give them through a straw. If we have medications that have a bad taste, we might have to put them further back um, where there's less taste buds. Um, or we might have to block the sense of smell by holding the nose when we're drinking it. And then contra in, contraindications for your oral medications is if your patient's NPO or they're comatose or they're at risk for aspiration, right? We're not going to give the medication orally if they're possibly going to aspirate it because it's not going to work. So we can't just not treat. We need to obtain a prescription for an alternative route or request to give the medication in another way. So um, if I'm at risk for aspiration, for really thin stuff, and it's a liquid, I might have to put some thick in it, right? Um, so we just need to critically think, why is my patient NPO? Can I just give it with a small sip of water, right? Sometimes physicians will say NPO except for meds. And then sometimes patients are NPO because no matter what, they're not allowed to have anything in their mouth. So at that point, either they do not get their medications or we substitute their medications in a different route. Patients who have difficulty swallowing, right? We have to be cautious of things that we crush. Certain medications are not allowed to be crushed. Um, so it, those enteric coated potassiums are not allowed to be crushed. So we might have to go into a liquid potassium. If you're not sure, you would need to check that um, drug reference to know if the medication can be crushed or not. And then we have our topical agents. So um, we have lotions, creams, ointments. Um, to enhance absorption, we want to make sure that the skin is clean, put soap and water. We want to pat it dry before applying the lotions, creams, or ointments. Um, if we warm the medication in the glove of our hand, it can be more comfortable when we're applying it to the patient. We want to use a cotton swab, tongue blade, or glove finger to apply it. Um, and then certain medications, we need to know what the effects would be if they're warmed. Um, like capsaicin, if you put capsaicin on a patient for joint relief, if we warm capsaicin up, it can actually burn the patient, so you need to be cautious. Transdermal patches are designed to be absorbed through the skin. Transdermal medications are prepared as patches made with special membranes to them. Patches allow for constant controlled amounts of medications to be released over a 20 hour period, 24 hour period or more, giving a prolonged systemic effect. If your patient has a transdermal patch that has the potential to be abused and your patient has the potential to do the abuse, you might have to put your transdermal patch in a location that your patient cannot reach. 
if we're using an eye, which would be an ophthalmic, we have ophthalmic ointments and we have ophthalmic drops. Um, those have both local and systemic effects. So we just need to know what the drug is. Um, some of them are gonna be to treat irritations and other of them might treat actual um, processes like glaucoma or macular degeneration. Our ears, those would be your otics. So medications or solutions that can be dropped into the ear to treat internal and external ear infections. Um, sometimes we can apply heat to the area to soften and remove earwax prior to putting it in because the earwax is gonna inhibit it from getting um, to the patient's spot of their ear that it needs to treat. We have um, nasal, which clients usually self-administer nose drops or sprays. The most common nasal medications are used to shrink swollen mucous membranes and to loosen secretions and provide drainage for treatment of the nasal cavity and for sinus infection. We can have vaginal medications that come in various forms like foams, jellies, liquids, creams, tablets, and suppositories. They may be used for contraception or to destroy bacteria in the vaginal area before a gynecological surgery to reduce vaginal dryness related to menopause, which should treat vaginal itching or infections, or to induce labor. We also have rectal suppositories and liquid installations like enemas. These are used to encourage bowel movements, to treat systemic complaints. Absorption is slow and erratic because of the rectal contents. Local drug irritation and uncertainty for drug retention in the rectum. Um, one medication that we commonly give rectally would be um, lactulose, which is supposed to pull the ammonia out. Um, the patient's supposed to be able to retain that enema, and a lot of times they're not able to retain the medication that way. So that would be an example of um, that erratic unknown absorption. So we also have our respiratory medications, which if you're working in a hospital, you usually have a respiratory therapist who helps administer some of these. We have nebulizers, nebulization, right? And nebulization is the production of a fine spray, fog, powder, or mist from a liquid drug. The patient inhales the medication mixture by breathing deeply through a mouthpiece. Um, attached to a nebulizer. The airways and the alveoli are highly vascularized and therefore absorbed inhaled medications rapidly. And then the, so your atomizers disperse the medication in the form of large dropules. Aerosols suspend the droplets of medications in gas like an oxygen. A meter dose inhaler is a type of nebulizer that delivers measured dose of nebulized drugs. And an ultrasonic handheld nebulizer mixes a small amount of medication, usually less than one ml, with three mls of normal saline, and device forces the air through the nebulizer and delivers medication and humidity as a fine mist that can be inhaled deep into the lungs. And that would be um, typically when you hear people say, I'm taking my breathing treatment, that's what that is. So then we have our parental medications, right? And your parental medication includes those that are injected or infused into the body systems or the bloodstream via intradermal, subcutaneous, intramuscular, or intravenous route. Your advantages are that they are absorbed faster and more completely than drugs given by other routes. Therefore, the results of them are more predictable and dosages can be measured more accurately. Parental medications can be used for patients who cannot take oral medications. Your disadvantages of these drugs is tissue damage can result if the pH osmotic pressure or solubility of the medication is not given appropriately to the tissue where the medication is given. For example, medications intended for injection into the muscle can cause damage to the subcutaneous tissue. 
our precautions, we need to prepare and administer parental medications accurately because the medication once given cannot be retrieved. We must also use aseptic techniques because the body's first layer of defense against microorganisms is the skin, and we're gonna be breaking the skin when we give these drugs. So we have our intradermal, which this medication is given into the dermis or the layer of the skin located beneath the skin surface. The intradermal route is commonly used for allergy or tubercular intestine. Most nurses use the patient's non-dominant arm for DP screening and the dominant arm, chest, or upper back for all other tests. So if you've ever had skin prick tests for allergies, it's typically on your, um, your arm or your chest or your upper back. Subcutaneous medications are given into subcutaneous tissue, which is the layer of fat located below the dermis and above the muscle. Absorption is slower than through the intramuscular route because subcutaneous tissue does not have as rich of a blood supply as muscle. However, we can speed up absorption varies with the subcutaneous site selected. Sites on the abdomen and arms are off for faster absorption than those on the thigh and upper buttocks. The slowest absorption is the thigh and upper buttocks. Medication is absorbed more evenly from the abdomen than from the thighs and buttocks because it's less affected by activity. Patients using these sites need to rotate their injection location. Your intramuscle injection is um, into the muscle. Medications are absorbed faster than subcutaneous. Medications um, is, the reason it's faster is because of the rich blood supply to the muscles. Muscles can tolerate more fluids. You can give as much as three or four mLs of liquid into the large vastus lateratus and the eventual medium muscles. The smaller muscles um, have less fluid can be tolerated. So if you're going to do your delt joint, you're not going to want to put a lot of fluid in that. And then we have our intravenous. So medications are given through a central or cannula in catheter inserted into the vein. The onset of medication action takes place within seconds. So IV administration is especially useful in our emergencies. However, because an IV drug begins to act immediately, there's no way for us to stop its action if a reverse reaction occurs, uh, unless there's an antidote. So when we're preparing for our medication administration, we want to um, prepare and we have ampules. An ampule is a thin wall disposable glass container with a narrow neck that we have to snap off to access the medication. To prevent injuries, use an ampule opener to snap the glass. Each ampule holds a single dose of medication. It's usually somewhere around one to 10 mLs. Some can hold 50 mLs because glass Fragments may be introduced into the medication. Most agencies require you to use a filter needle or a filter straw to draw up the medication. A single vial is a dose. Oh, I'm sorry. A vial can either be a single vial or a multi-dose. These are plastic or glass containers with a rubber stopper that seals the top after each needle introduction. The plastic or metal cap covers the rubber stopper to protect it until it's used. Because the vial is closed system, we must inject air into, the, into it and then withdraw the solution. Otherwise, a vacuum is created in the vial and makes withdrawal difficult. We have reconstituting from powder. So medications that are not stable in a solution are dispensed as powder and vials. We need to add a dilute or a solvent to the powder to create a solution for injection. The dilute is usually sterile water or saline. However, each package vial includes the manufacturer's instruction for their amount and kind of solvent that needs to be added. For safety, 
use a plastic bottle access cannula instead of a needle when possible. Two medications in one syringe. We can mix two medications in the same syringe if they are compatible. If the total dose is within the acceptable limits and if both are to be given at the same route. This technique allows for effective use of supplies and allows the patient to receive fewer injections. Medications are compatible if they can be mixed without affecting their constitutes or actions. Package inserts and medication references usually include compatibility information. Our safety issues, we need to make sure that we're using sharps containers, puncture-proof containers. We want to avoid recapping needles. We want to make sure that we're using the correct site because the wrong site is the wrong route, which means that your patient's absorption could be different. And we need to be familiar with techniques required for certain medications. So heparin and insulin would be examples of that. When we talk about our parental medication for IV, we have IV push, which we don't do IV push in lab for first for fundamentals, but we're going to teach you about it so that you have a basis when you go on. So medications are injected directly into the systemic circulation. Many drugs can be given by IV push and have a package insert that contains specific guidelines for the administration rate. Typically, it's between one to 10 minutes. We need to read the package insert or inquire how fast the drug should be pushed. Even just a minute can seem like a very long time when you're pushing a medication. So we don't want to guess. We want to look at our watch. We want to take note that the IV push is not the same as given rapidly. If it's given too rapidly, IV drugs, particularly potassium, can be quite dangerous. Um, and then IV piggyback would be um, a setup, which is a smaller secondary container, and it's connected to the primary continuous infusion line. And um, it allows for intermittent use of the medication. The medicated drugs would be things that we use in like ICU or um, heparin and insulin come in drips. Those are slowly given um, with very, very specific rates. We typically will titrate them, um, which means adjust them based on what's going on with our patient. And that is the end of your medication lecture. Thank you.